This episode is brought to you by FX's The Veil, starring Elizabeth Moss. FX's The Veil is an international spy thriller that follows two women as they play a deadly game of truth and lies on the road from Istanbul to Paris and London. One woman has a secret, and the other has a mission to reveal it before thousands of lives are lost. FX's The Veil premieres April 30th, only on Hulu. Welcome back, all CHP listeners from all across the universe. Laszlo Montgomery back with more Chinese philosophy, just as the title of the episode advertises. Thanks for listening to the China History Podcast, and I promised you last time we're going to continue on with more Ru School philosophy and look at Mengzi, also known by his Latinized name of Mengxius. I finished off last time speaking about Mengzi's mother and her role in shaping the Confucianist demands that women had to put up with. She's always held up as this shining example of the perfectly devoted mother. Let me start with the most famous Mengzi story from his early years that gave us one of the most famous Chinese sayings, or cheng yu. This was Meng Mu San Qian, which translates to Mengzi's mother moves three times. It was just the two of them growing up, no father. Meng Mu, Mengzi's mother, settled down first at a shack near a cemetery and noticed right away little Mengzi engaging in these pretend ceremonies for the dead. So... She didn't like to see that and decided to pick up and move to a place near a thriving market town. But before long, she saw her son acting like some merchant and talking about money all the time. So she pulled up stakes again and found a third place that had a school as its closest landmark. And when Mengzi's mother saw her son trying to learn and show some manners and decency, she decided she finally found the right place. Meng Mu San Qian. Yeah, this, this whole idea of Chinese mothers who want the best education for their children. Trust me, that didn't start with Amy Chua. It went back at least as far as Meng Mu, the mother of Meng Zi. And although it went against the Confucian idea of simplicity and frugality, when Meng Zi's mother passed away, her filial son gave her one heck of a glorious, well-deserved send-off, one that I'm willing to bet Mo Tzu wouldn't have approved of. Master Kong, Confucius, simply resting on his own laurels, most likely today would not be gracing the name of these hundreds of Confucius institutes around the world. We remember Confucius because he received a little help along the way first from his immediate disciples, and then from Meng Zi, followed by Xun Zi, and then I guess by Dong Zhong Shu. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. They were the first ones to begin the process of interpreting what it was Confucius taught when he was alive. Remember, Kong Fu Zi didn't write anything down. Meng Zi was born after Confucius, who had already been gone for 107 years. I mentioned at the outset he supposedly studied under Confucius's grandson, Zi Si, and the first thing Meng Zi did when he left the nest was to hang out his own shingle and open up a school. Having studied under someone like Zi Si was like bragging you had a Harvard or Yale degree. So Meng Zi was able to attract a lot of students, many who went on to great things in the government and civil service. Meng Zi was no different from any of these philosophers, anxious to advise rulers on how to rule their state and how to bring about the greatest amount of prosperity, peace, stability, and happiness for the people. From about 323 to 314 BCE, Meng Zi did his wandering. He went to Qi first and found employment with the ruler there, Qi Xuan Gong, Duke Xuan of Qi. He accepted an honorary post and refused any salary. But in advising Duke Xuan, Meng Zi soon figured out he wasn't being taken seriously. So Meng Zi moved on, but Duke Xuan of Qi called him back. Meng Zi soon saw that it was futile trying to turn this militant king into a benevolent and virtuous leader. This Duke Xuan had all kinds of designs on other states and was looking to acquire some kingdoms. Meng Zi implored him to make peace, not war, and to rule his people with benevolence and morality, and to serve as a model for his people. 
Then not only his subjects and Chi would revere him, but others would flock to Chi as well, just to call him their ruler. Well, it's not surprising that Meng Tzu ultimately got canned by Qi Xuan Gong. This pugnacious ruler didn't like Meng Tzu's pacifism. So like all these itinerant philosophers, Meng Tzu moved on to the next place, always vigilant for that philosopher king in the rough who only needed Meng Tzu's finishing touches to turn him into the virtuous Zhou Dynasty founder King Wen Reborn. Like Confucius and no doubt many a philosopher, Meng Tzu searched in vain. In the end, he just settled down and returned to teaching. Besides teaching, he wrote about all the rulers he had rubbed elbows with during his travels and discussed the conversations he had with them. And these dialogues were all part of the book that bears his name, the Meng Tzu. It's one of the classics. Some say this was one of those ancient works that was actually written by the alleged author, rather than his disciples or, or those who came after him. But 300 BCE? We can't say for sure. Meng Tzu taught the original goodness of human nature. Innately, humans were good. He called it Xing Shan. Like Aristotle and later John Locke's Tabula Rasa, people were born good. They are made bad thanks to poor leadership setting a bad example. And this bad example, set by others, impacted people who didn't know any better. Meng Tzu said either philosophers must become kings, or kings must become philosophers. Meng Tzu's philosophy claims that human beings have four beginnings. Here's how we put them. Quote, The feeling of commiseration is the beginning of human-heartedness. The feeling of shame and dislike is the beginning of righteousness. The feeling of modesty and yielding is the beginning of propriety. The sense of right and wrong is the beginning of wisdom. End quote. These four beginnings are also called the four virtues. Some in the West have referred to them as Meng Tzu's four cardinal virtues. All people are born with them, these innate ethical predispositions. And throughout one's life, it was essential to nurture and develop these four virtues so that in time, they will become the four constant virtues. By further developing the four constant virtues, one can achieve sagehood. So these four virtuous qualities, benevolence, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom, we all have it. But if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Meng Tzu would tell you of the four virtues benevolence and righteousness were the two most important. So you could see why Meng Tzu would completely reject someone like Yang Zhu. Meng Tzu was an optimist. He said it was a moral universe that humans inhabited, and it all began at the top with a virtuous ruler who ruled through benevolence and set an example for uprightness and propriety for all his subjects to see. Sure, people cared about many of these pleasures itemized by Yang Zhu, but Meng Tzu said people were also ethical and knew what the right thing to do was. Confucius put his focus on the individual and to a lesser extent on the state. Meng Tzu's focus was the state. It all began with the ruler, and not only that. On the one hand, Meng Tzu taught what the qualities that a ruler must have and exhibit. He was also very Jeffersonian in his belief that if rulers became inept or any jiez or zhou xins appeared on the scene, the people have the right to remove them, even kill them if it came to that. These were very radical ideas for their time. And because Meng Tzu was well known for this line of political philosophy, the Hongwu Emperor, after he founded the Ming Dynasty in 1368, will ban him, demoting Meng Tzu in the Confucian Temple. Yeah, early Ming, Meng Tzu will have to lay low and remain in the doldrums until he makes a comeback. The early Ming emperors didn't like that Jeffersonian belief about the Tree of Liberty needing to be refreshed with the blood of patriots and tyrants every so often. And as far as democracy goes and that whole notion of government of the people and by the people, Meng Tzu didn't go for that. He thought monarchy was the only way to go. Why was that? He said in order for the system to work, all people had to be educated. If not, the system breaks down and there's chaos. 
nothing outtrumps a benevolent and virtuous ruler leading by example. That's all it takes. One single philosopher king. In fact, Mengzi said there were two kinds of rulers. One was a Wang and one was a Ba. A Wang rules by virtue and benevolence, basically how Confucius thought they should conduct themselves. Wang means king. And Ba, they ruled by force. This would be like a feudal lord or military hegemon. Mengzi was vehemently anti-war. He thought it was a crime and nothing good ever came of it, and certainly no one deserved to be lionized for their military achievements. As far as Mozi was concerned, Mengzi's major beef with him was that impartial caring thing. To Mengzi, putting the extent of your total caring on a stranger the same way you would your own flesh and blood, let alone your parents? Pshaw, as Tom Sawyer would have said. Mengzi was the shining star of the idealistic wing of Confucianism. He had a lot of detractors. For one thing, Mengzi's thought was criticized by many for being artificial. People weren't born good. They had to work hard to be good. All this morality and propriety, it was all artificial and forced, not the natural way people acted. Let's close things out with Xunzi. He was another major Confucianist, but he didn't see eye to eye with everything Mengzi said, especially about the innate goodness of human nature. Everyone knows Confucius. Everyone knows Mengxius, Mengzi. How come Xunzi didn't get a Latinized name? Maybe for this reason, he remains in the shadow of his two more famous predecessors. Xunzi's name was Xun Kuang. He was a native of Zhao State, but he made his name in Qi. He lived from 313 to 238 BCE, passing away 17 years before Qin Shi Huang enjoyed the sweet smell of success in 221 BCE. So we can say he lived during the last decades of the Warring States period. He was 24 when Mengzi died. But let me say, there's quite a disparity in Xunzi's dates as far as when Historians say he actually lived and died. Like Mengzi, Kongzi, and others, Xunzi did his tour of the realm as well, calling on rulers, princes, and anyone in authority who would see him. Like those other great thinkers, Xunzi would try to proffer his advice to those in power on the best ways to end the misery, violence, and bloodletting of the Eastern Zhou Warring States period. But this philosopher's renown ended up being due to his stature at the Jixia Academy. Xunzi left his mark as one of the greatest philosophers to come out of this Jixia Xue Gong. This institution was set up in 318 BCE by, yes, Duke Xuan of Qi, Qi Xuan Gong, one and the same as the ruler who wasted Mengzi's time. Yeah, he didn't listen to Mengzi, but he did act as the benefactor of this school that attracted La creme de la creme of pre Qin dynasty teachers and philosophers. This was China's first think tank. There, the most brilliant and innovative minds in what comprised China that far back came together to teach, to learn, to loaf, drink tea, complain, and argue all their respective schools of thought. Let's look at Xunzi, and particularly through the prism of Mengzi, since he's so fresh in our minds right now. They were both dyed-in-the-wool Confucianists, but they didn't see eye-to-eye on a few key points. What do we most remember Xunzi for? Well, Lao Tzu's name is mentioned for the first time in Xunzi's work. Do you remember how Mengzi said people by nature are good? They are corrupted by all the blowback from having an inferior ruler? Mengzi maintained one had to focus and work deliberately to retain their innate goodness. Well, Xunzi, he said just the opposite, and in this respect, he was in lockstep with Yang Zhu. Xunzi said human nature was innately bad. Human nature's natural inclination is to be selfish and look out for number one first and foremost. Innately, people are in a sense evil and self-centered, and from that base, he taught his philosophy. After all, if people were, as Mengzi said, innately good, then who would need these 
sage kings and all these boring rituals and strict etiquette. Shunza said, Don't blame the government for all the ills in society. They have nothing to do with the people's innate goodness. It was up to the people to become good. And this was attained by basically following Confucian thought. This included the rituals and ceremonies. Shunza said even though most everyone was lip-syncing and artificially embracing Confucianism and rituals in their daily lives, it was important to the masses of people, especially at the state level, having rulers carry out these elaborate rituals, no matter to heaven or to ancient ancestors. They were carrying out something that was very important to the people who were unable to express these emotions and feelings in this kind of way. It united ruler and people. Whether it worked or not was immaterial. Shunza had written about how these rituals bound society as one, but, he said, quote, you pray for rain, and it rains. Why? For no particular reason, I say. It's just as though you had not prayed for rain, and it rained anyway. End quote. But Shunza and Mengzi agreed on the idea that no matter born good or born evil, a person can become a sage. And to do this, one needed to be disciplined and live their life in the most deliberate way, not only talking the talk. Both philosophers believed the transformative powers of Confucian sincerity, ritual, and learning could turn someone into a sage and keep society on an even keel. As for Mengzi's four virtues, four beginnings that human nature contained, not so, said Xunzi. No four virtues. But there was one thing that humans were born with that was the key to rising above their innate desires for personal profit and sensual pleasures. And that was intelligence. Intelligence is the key to becoming good. The learning, which is the natural byproduct of intelligence, should be used by the people to reform their innate, unsavory human nature. It would reform them and transform them. Mengzi said all this learning was like ongoing education for what was already good within you. Mengzi said becoming a Yao or a Shun was possible because people were born good. And if one could sustain this goodness throughout their life, they might one day look upon Yao and Shun as equals. Shunzi said nobody's born a Yao, but people had intelligence, and if they use this they could one day become a Yao. I read that of this school of Ru philosophy, Confucius, all his disciples and their disciples, Mengzi, Xunzi, that Mengzi is considered the left wing of the ideology and Xunzi is the right wing. All of Xunzi's philosophy is contained in, I know, you guessed it, another work named after the author, the Xunzi. This 32-chapter work has a somewhat unique claim to fame among the classics. It's said that at least 25 of the chapters were actually written by Shunzi, and a lot of it was written in essay style, and very nicely, too. Works attributed to Mengzi and Kongzi were usually written in dialogue form. What Shunzi did that separated himself from Mengzi was to look at the times they lived in, and he synthesized other elements of thought that weren't necessarily Confucian in their origin. He picked around other schools of thought for ideas that could be copied and pasted onto Confucianism. In addition to Confucian ethics, he studied how others viewed ethics. He also gathered aspects of metaphysics, political theory, philosophy of language and education, and whatever was applicable to Confucianism and enhanced it as an ideology, he considered it. The Confucian Dao is not the same as the Laozi Zhuangzi Dao. Mengzi's Dao was more in line with the Daoists in that the Dao was the way of heaven and nature. Xunzi's Dao focused on humanity. This Dao, or way, was the Dao of human behavior the way one is supposed to act in maintaining a harmonious society. Shunza said nature is nature and heaven is heaven, and nothing can change that. It's a waste of time to speculate about it. Shunza's philosophy was closer to home, concerned only with the practical aspects of humanity, the human way, the human dao, a way of behaving. 
Okay, we will most certainly come back to Shinza later on. I wanted to introduce him to you, and I hope that you'll remember him. Kongzi, Mengzi, Shinza. These were the three giants of the pre-Qin dynasty Ru school of philosophy. I didn't say this, but Shinza is famous for one other thing. And during the Qin dynasty, this was a good thing. But in the Han dynasty, it wasn't. Shunzi had two famous students when he was teaching at the Jixia Academy in Qi State. These were Han Fei and Li Si. It was the teaching of these two shining stars of Shunzi, Han Fei and Li Si, who provided all the requisite ideology that Qin Shi Huang needed to rule his empire. All for next time. So let's close things out and bring down the curtains. Legalism is an ancient philosophy that gets discussed quite a bit in the 2020s with respect to the merits of what it espouses. So this one you probably won't want to miss. Until that time, you little beauties, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, as usual. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.